Hi, this is Rick, and today I'm going to be giving you some training on the cloud retailer point of sale. So when you first activate the program, uh, it greets you with a login screen. So everybody has a username and password, and this determines what they can or cannot do. So I can type it on a keyboard or I can touch on the screen to proceed. So the, um, the application right now, by the way, is running on a Windows Surface Pro tablet. Uh, it is also can work on a stationary Windows computer as well, but it is comfortable in both environments. Um, all the buttons are very touchable. On the other hand, you can see that I have access to F9 and F12 to execute these functions. So I don't need a touch screen, uh, though it's helpful. I could click on these with the mouse, or I could hit an F key on my keyboard to do the same thing. Um, now, uh, one option that I have enabled in, in this demo environment is that the system is prompting me and letting me know, hey, you're trying to access the cash register, but you haven't punched into the time clock yet. A common complaint we get from our customers is that cashiers forget to punch in and out. And this is a way to, to uh, stop them from doing that if you use the time clock feature of this program, which is built in, or um, you can turn this prompt off if you don't. Now notice, back on this login screen, as I was typing my username and password in, I had the option to punch in or out of the time clock directly from the login screen, so I don't even need to access the POS in order to punch in, and out, in or out. So I'm going to continue without punching in. Now while we're on the topic of talking about a form factor, you know, tablets versus PCs, um, another function that we have access to if you're running this on a tablet where you're not going to have access to a keyboard um, and let's say you need to search for uh, a type of bottle of wine or something like that you're going to see this little keyboard icon throughout the application and if you touch on it you're going to get access to a full on-screen keyboard if you want to make it go away click it again um, so I'm going to search for J-A-D-A Okay, not very uh, sensical here, right? So I'm gonna hit enter, and you notice that annoying noise, that kind of angry noise that it made. That's to let a cashier know that a prompt appeared and they need to do something with it. So another problem that we've attempted to solve with Cloud Retailer is that cashiers don't really pay attention to the screen. They're talking to the customer, which is a good thing. We want their attention to be focused there not on the computer system. Uh, so um, JADA brought up Jack Daniels. The search is very powerful, very intelligent. You don't really have to do a lot of thinking or know precisely how something is spelled in order to find it. Um, once I search for a product, um, I can uh, you add it to the sales transaction or I can do a number of other things with it as well. For example, I could print a label. Another problem that we've tried to solve here is that we want to make it very easy if a cashier is walking down the aisle and they notice the shelf tags missing off of a product or off of a shelf, they can just go into the point of sale and print a label quickly. Label printing and more advanced label printing functionality is accessible from the back office, but there's some decent label printing functions built in at the POS. Um, additionally is the ability to look at product attributes. So I'm going to search for a different product. So we have this Italian wine here. Um, and actually, I'm going to search for Italy. Searching for Italy brought up this product. Another example of how intelligent the search is. So if I go to product attributes, I can see that the body of this wine is full. The color is red. It's from Italy. It's from this region of Italy. Um, etc. So it's a topic for, for another training video, but you can have uh, predefined product attributes for different types of, of items in your system. For example, wine, you can track the body, color, country, etc. On beer, you could track something totally different because maybe the drinkability and whether you should sell it or you should uh, drink it doesn't apply to beer, but the beer advocate score does or warranty information or what have you on certain types of products. I can also check the quantity at other store locations. So when I do that, I see a list 
of other stores and this list is sorted based on distance. So the next closest store to me, I'm in the quote unquote Minneapolis store, is Rochester, 78.5 miles away from me. They don't have any in stock, okay? But the Boise, Idaho store does. And I could, if I have an email client set up, like Outlook on this machine, I could send an email to them. Or, you know, if it wasn't a thousand miles away, I could potentially click on show route and um, print out directions in between one store to another and hand it to the customer. One topic I'm not going to get into in today's training video, but I want to make sure you're aware, is that we have the ability to, um, you know, if, if sending them an email and letting them know that a customer's coming or to set it aside or whatever isn't quite as um, sophisticated as you'd like, you do have the ability to create orders. And we'll talk a little bit about orders today, but you have the ability to create an order that can be recalled and processed at another store. So, Mr. Customer, I don't have it, but we have it in our Boise location. I can put it on order for you, and they'll ship it out directly to you from that store. That is possible with Cloud Retailer. Um, so, I'm going to add this to the transaction so that we can get through a simple transaction um, here. And I'm going to go to subtotal. Now, another thing about the keyboard here, if you do choose to use a keyboard, is that you can assign an F key value to any of these buttons. Again, system is designed from the ground up to be touch friendly, but if you really needed to use that keyboard, you can do that. Uh, we have uh, converted lots of RMS users, Microsoft RMS for example, and the F12 key is tender in that system, so you could assign F12 to subtotal to replicate that experience. Tender window is very friendly, and another theme that you'll notice in this application is, you know, trying to make this foolproof for cashiers, make it very easy and self-explanatory to use. In this day and age, it seems like, you know, staff turnover is going nowhere but up. It's important that we be able to train a cashier in five minutes and have them competent on the system, and I think we've, we've done a good job of making it really easy. So I've got my different tender types on the screen. I choose which one I want to pay with. And um, I choose the amount of money that I'm going to pay with. And now if it's cash, I've got these easy access buttons. We'll come back to that. Or I have a button for the exact amount owed or a button for the exact amount owed rounded up to the nearest dollar. So for now, I'm going to keep it simple. That's what we're going to choose. This change window appears. It tells me how much is owed. The cash drawer pops. Potentially, a receipt prints. So a lot of people, um, you know, don't print receipts in this day and age. But we can have the system automatically print a receipt, or we can make it so that the cashier has to opt to print one. Or you also have the ability to email a receipt. Um, now, in terms of the system being smart. This is a pretty good example of where it's, it's, you know, of where I can kind of show some of the intelligence. So I could close this window and then start scanning items. But if I just start scanning items, the system's smart enough to know, hey, look, they scanned a product. That must mean that they want to close that window and begin the next transaction. Or if I go to subtotal and I scan an item, okay, in most retail systems out there. If you scanned an item right now, one of two things would happen. One is you tender the transaction for eight billion dollars or whatever the the dollar value of that barcode was, um, or you get some kind of ugly error message. But with Cloud Retailer, if I scan an item, it's smart enough to know that I must not want to tender that transaction. I want to add an item. So it closes the tender window. You know, you have those customers where they bring up all their stuff and you're talking to them and they realize you know that they want uh, one of those tchotchkes that's on the counter oh you know I'm paying for it and you tell them the total and they say oh I, I want this too so again cashiers not looking at the screen not a problem the system's smart um, outside of going to the subtotal window where I could choose a value I'm actually gonna add one more item to this 
So we're going to go to the subtotal window, and it's 2832. I'm going to hit 20, and then I'm going to hit 20 again. Okay, that was $40, two $20 bills. So again, super easy, but if I scan an item, um, and I have those quick, those quick keys, um, you know, for most of our customers, uh, a majority of their transactions are credit card for the exact amount owed or a $20 bill in cash. So these buttons over here on the right hand side are totally customizable. How many there are, what they do, uh, what color they are, what they say. Um, you could expand, you know, like the Surface Pro is a widescreen, so you could, there's plenty of room here for more buttons. Um, you know, we have coffee shop customers where they have all their different coffee selections, and so you can change what these do, what they say, etc. You can also make it so that these buttons drill down into other button pads, and you can have as many of those as you want, again, totally customizable by you. Um, so if I say tender $20 bill, I mean one click and I've executed that transaction. If I scan an item and I say credit card, uh, you know, it's going to tender a credit card for the exact amount owed in one click. Um, so super fast way to execute a transaction if it's a credit card for the exact amount of order if it's twenty dollars but the buttons are customizable you know it doesn't have to be credit card it could be tender exact amount cash or whatever you want so when it comes to processing a credit card in the scenario I just went through I had to sign for the transaction and because of the size of the transaction, it was over $20. So with cloud retailer, we have the ability to configure uh, the amount of money that, uh, that, that uh, threshold for when a signature is required or not. You'll need to consult with your credit card processing company, but as far as we're aware, depending on if it's Visa or MasterCard, it's either $25 or $50 where the credit card processing company basically doesn't care about whether or not you collect a signature. Um, which can save you some time. You know, a customer not having to stop and perform that step might improve your transaction speed by four or five seconds. And depending on the environment, the type of retail environment you're in, that can, that can be a lot of time saved in terms of moving the line. Um, with EMV, those microchips on the new credit cards, there are certain times where the point of sale system has no control over whether a signature is collected at all. So uh, when you process a chip card, there are instances where the bank basically dictates whether there's a signature, no signature, or a PIN. And if we get that directive, then there's no way to override it. So just know that if you set a threshold to be um, you know, $25 and the transaction's 30, there are cases where it may not prompt for a signature. And what's interesting is that the next day, it might or vice versa. And as far as we're aware, this is based on some fraud, you know, artificial intelligence that they have on the bank side. You know, the higher the risk, the more validation that they want. Um, so that's a basic, you know, those are basic tenders, but we can get a lot more sophisticated with uh, split tendering and things like that if we need to. So split tendering can be as simple as you know, putting $5 on a credit card and then the rest in cash. And notice after I typed in the $5, the amount due went down and these buttons automatically updated based on the new state of this transaction. So if I tender this, I just put uh, $5 on a credit card and 20 on a uh, on cash. And so now I'm going to process this transaction and away we go. Um, I can take that a couple of steps further, though, and I could split a single tender type. So that's what this little icon here is for. It's a dollar sign cut in half, and this means we can split the tender type. Um, now, I mentioned that the tenders and their behaviors are configurable. So the fact that credit cards are something we can split and gift cards are something that we can split 
is based on configuration. So you can turn that on or off if you'd like. But you hypothetically could run three gift cards and two credit cards um, if you wanted to. The sky is kind of the limit. Okay, one more tender that I want to show you is um, a gift card. So if I go into the subtotal menu, I've got this option for gift card, and when I tender it, um, it's prompting me for a gift card number. Now I'm going to scan a barcode. You can hypothetically use a magnetic stripe reader um, and a magnetic stripe on your gift cards. We strongly recommend that you use barcoded gift cards. They're cheaper to make. They're more durable. You know, magnetic stripes get demagnetized, um, and um, uh, and they're you know with with cloud retailer considering that the payment terminal is used by the customer and is not directly attached to the POS. With most of our systems, we don't, we don't sell a magnetic stripe uh, reader anymore. In some cases, we do uh, where driver's license reading is a big deal. And we'll get into that in a little bit. I'll do a demonstration. Um, but uh, barcoded gift cards are the way to go. So I'm going to scan a gift card. OK, the transaction completes. Um, this actually made a real-time call to your cloud retailer back office. This works great with multiple store locations. Um, if your internet connection is down, um, then you won't be able to process gift cards. So cloud retailer is very robust in terms of operating without an internet connection. If your internet goes down, for the most part, a cashier is not going to notice um, except uh, in terms of normal POS operation. It won't slow things down. They'll be able to search for products. They'll be able to find customers, update their records, except for a few key things. One of them is gift cards. Another one are orders. So we'll get to orders here in a little bit, uh, like holds or potentially if, you're, if you have an integrated e-commerce website and you're trying to fetch those orders. And then the last one is credit cards. Um, however, if you're using certain credit card processors, Celerant, for example, we can do what's called store and forward type transactions where you can process credit cards without an internet connection, though you're taking some risk when you do, um, but very resilient to the internet being down. Um, let's take a look at the receipt that prints out when you do a gift card. So um, here's what the receipt can look like. And you'll notice that it prints the amount that was tendered to the gift card. It also prints the balance. Now, this XXX at the end is a mask. Um, we don't print the full gift card number on here, just like you wouldn't print the full credit card number on a receipt. You wouldn't want a cashier picking it up off the floor or out of the trash and spending somebody's gift card. So the mask is there for the safety of the customer and for you. Um, and the barcode is also useful. We'll come back to that. Um, but I'm going to go into additional tools. So when I click on this button, it's going to bring me into another menu. So you can have as many of these menus. You can define the functions, how many buttons, etc. I'm going to go to gift card history. I'm going to scan that gift card again. Okay, you can see the balance. Here again, uh, the gift card number is masked. You can see when it was created, the last time it was used. You can see the store where it originated. I can see a history of every transaction that's taken place on this gift card. So if a customer is saying, hey, I bought this gift card for 250 bucks and I've never used it. Well, what, what's up with that? Well, you can tell them exactly what's happened. You can even see history that's happened at other stores, like there was Dallas and Boise's in here too. Now, if I go back to sell a gift card, I'm going to say $25. Um, oops, I actually need the gift card code here. Okay, $25 we're going to put on this card. Now, this is the gift card 
that I just sold, okay, or I just used on that last transaction. So gift cards are reloadable. Um, you can increase or decrease their value as many times as you want. So you can see the new balance is $127. Okay, so next let's talk a little bit about discounts. So you probably noticed on the right hand side I've got these buttons to undo discount, wine case discount, military discount, etc. So discounts can be driven um, with Cloud Retailer three different ways. One is with a button, two is they automatically, and three is with a coupon. Coupon might sound, you know, like Zubas in 1995, but actually they're having a pretty strong resurgence right now. Um, with Claw Retailer, you can generate a coupon code. That's a, it's a, called a QR code. So you can post this to social media, like Facebook, and people can bring their phone in and the barcode's right on there, and you can scan it to execute the discount. Um, pretty cool way to track whether or not you're getting traction uh, on social media. Anyway, the discount schemes are a topic for another discussion that you set up in the back office, but essentially you define a group of products and kind of a, uh, a set of rules around them to determine when the discount is, can be applied and when it can't. This, these schemes are the same, whether it's a coupon, automatic, or, or a button. So um, I'm going to give an example. So we've got a special buy two bottles of a certain type of thing. You get them for a discount. So I'll add, um, I'll add this product. So it's $22.99, and I'll add another product, okay, which was also $22.99. Um, I talked about the point of sale being smart. So with discounts, we think the point of sale is really smart. Um, smart because it knows uh, when a qualification is met, two for 20. Um, smart also because it makes it very clear to the cashier and the customer what's going on with this transaction. So if I'm a cashier, I know that $22.99 was the original price. I can see it there, it's crossed out, and I can see the new price is $20. I also get a description of why the discount occurred. Product discount, two for 20 liquor. That's what I call this promotion. Really does not get any easier than that for a cashier. They didn't have to do anything, and if there's a question, they know the answer. Now this level of detail is also provided on the customer display if you choose to, um, to, to use one. Obviously it doesn't look just like this, it's a little bit more promotional uh, based, but they understand that they got that cash, that, that discount that they were supposed to get. Um, I'm going to tender this transaction and we're going to look at a different example. So I'm going to ring up one of these items, I'm going to ring up a bottle of wine, then I'm going to ring up um, some beer. Okay, now um, I have this button called military discount. And so, by the way, our opinion is that as much as you can, you should automate your discounts. Don't make the cashiers think about it. Um, and with Cloud Retailer, I mean, you can really build some sophistication in so that you can do that. Um, however, there are times or there are reasons why people want to have a 5% off button or whatever. And if you need those things, we can do, we can do those things. So a military discount is a semi-sophisticated discount. It's not going to be automatically applied to a transaction because the cashier needs to tell us if the person in front of us is, is in the service. So if I click this button, notice that it gave a discount to the Behringer White Zinfandel and the rum chata, but it did not to the beer. Okay, that's because beer is not a part of this, this discount offering. Okay, just like a wine case discount would only be applied to wine. We can even drive this in so far that it is only applied on certain days of the week. For example, Senior Citizens Day is on Tuesdays only. And if you tried to hit this button on Tuesday, uh, on any other day besides Tuesday, it would prompt the cashier that the discount's not active um, today. So very smart discounting. So I'm gonna tender this out. Now, um, notice too, I'm gonna do that again here quick. 
if I provide a military discount and then I keep scanning items, that military discount, you know, you can apply the discount kind of any time you want. It doesn't have to be at the beginning or the end of the transaction. Again, the discounting system is smart. Um, so I'm going to scan an item here. Now, if I go to other discounts, I have some other functions that I've added here. Um, also, you know, in terms of making the POS easy to use, uh, I can also click on price. And here again, this is a task pad. What is in here, what's not, is up to you. Okay, the colors, how many buttons, how many, it doesn't even necessarily have to be a discount function that you could have in here. Um, and notice uh, it is asking for a reason, um, uh, you know, wrong price. And I can say set price, and now I can say $21.99. Okay, and there you go. I mean, or it could just, it can be as simple or sophisticated as you want. One of the key things to take away from this is that discounts are tracked. Okay, the fact that this is a manual discount, this is a price override, and the reason that was entered is tracked by the system, and it's on your end of day reporting. End of day reporting is a training for another topic, but anytime money is going in or out of the till, you know, any kind of suspicious behavior, it's all there on that end of day report. It's a really nice thing. I'm going to tender this transaction and let's take a look at the receipt just so you get a sense of how this is displayed to a customer. So here again we strive to make this really simple for everybody involved to understand what's going on. Here's the product, the size, the quantity, regular price $21.99 discounted to $21.99. There should never be a question by a customer, did I get charged the right price? Um, we want to want to make it very straightforward. The receipt template is customizable as well. That would consume some premium services, but we make the receipt template look different, you know, vastly different for different customers all the time. Uh, also notice that if I needed to reprint this receipt, I could reprint it or I could email it if I, you know, if the customer, you know, like they always do, they change their mind. Do you want to email the receipt? No. And then I turn around and say, you know what, never mind, I'd like that. So you can come back and re-email that receipt at any time. So um, we've been talking about discounts, which inevitably raises the question of permissions. Like, will my cashiers do something they're not supposed to do? So any button on any of these task pads and a lot of the functions inside the system can be attached, you know, whether or not you can do them is based on a user role. So if you're a cashier, there are things you can and cannot do. If you're an administrator, you can do everything, that sort of thing. So there's another training video around task pads that dives deeper into some of the security settings. But if it's a task pad, you can enable or disable um, the ability to access these buttons. So open percentage off, like I can just type in whatever percent I want, you know, I would limit that. I wouldn't let just anybody do that. Um, but maybe the 10% off all is something you let people do. Or the price override, you know, if the price is wrong, you got to let cashiers do that. But here again, if somebody does something like this, you'll see it. Okay, so that should give you a good amount of consolation that, you know, give cashier, my, our theory is give cashiers plenty of ability to take care of the customer. That's the most important thing, but review, you know, make sure that they can't do anything that's not visible to you. Um, you know, to take that one step further, talk about permissions or sensitive actions. On each line item, I have this tax toggle on off. So if you click on um, various things on the window or touch on them, you'll get more details. So I can see the subtotal taxes in total. And if I turn taxes off, you can see that taxes are gone. Again, you can disable and enable who can do this um, or 
you know, you can, for example, uh, have buttons on the right hand side that can do this and tie permissions to that. Um, with tax exempt sales, our recommendation is that you use the customer functionality built into Cloud Retailer. We'll come back to this in a little bit. But you can identify customers being tax exempt and you can identify their sales tax ID. The nice thing about it about doing that is that if the IRS ever audits you, you have a report showing every time you've done a tax exempt sale, who you did it to, what their sales tax ID is. So it just is better than just kind of willy-nilly toggling that um, on or off. Uh, a couple of other um, actions on the point of sale that are kind of worthy of this kind of sensitive or audit trail discussion are the start over and the void line buttons. So I'm going to ring up a few items. And um, if I choose one uh, and I click void line, notice it, it removes the discount and it sets the price and the quantity to zero. So if you scan an item at the point of sale, there is no way to just make it disappear. This is a good thing for you. Um, it, technically, there's a setting in the back office where you can actually make a void line, make the line item disappear. However, we strongly do not recommend it. Everybody should use this, in my opinion. Um, the beautiful thing is you avoid situations where, for example, you know, and, and this is a this is a demo wine shop database liquor store, so I'm going to use those kinds of examples. But if I'm a cashier working at a store and I sell a case of Bud Light all day long, it's on sale or whatever, I know how much change to give to a customer and they give me a $20 bill because I just did that three times in a row. And so the problem can become that I scan their, the case of Bud Light, I, the customer hands me a $20 bill and let's pretend that I have a key to the cash drawer and I have it open. I can put their money in the drawer, give them back the appropriate amount of change, and then after they leave, I can take that money out and put the change back in. Basically, making my till balance, if I void the line out, it's like it never happened, and I can just take the money that they paid for for that beer. Pretty scary stuff, and with a lot of point-of-sale systems, we hear about that kind of thing happening. And you know, An employee stealing from you isn't 10 bucks, it's thousands it turns into thousands of dollars fast. So if somebody performs a void line, it's, it's in the system forever. And pretty much everything that's going on in the system, there's a pretty good paper trail. Even if I use this start over button, okay, it's gonna cancel the transaction and start me over from scratch. That's in the system. Who did it, when they did it, a, a picture of that receipt is in the system. Another kind of sensitive um, process relates to voiding transaction. And again, you can determine who can and cannot do this stuff. But if I go in the past receipts function, uh, here's all the transactions that occurred on this till today. Okay, 99.9% .9 of the time, that's enough for a cashier. That's what they need. They need to void this last transaction or they need to reprint a receipt. And that's all right here. Okay, you can hypothetically type in a transaction number to search for it, or you can put in a different date period, etc. But there's actually an easier way to deal with that. I'm going to come back around to that. Um, but, you know, I can view a signature associated with a credit card receipt and print it if I need to. I can print a gift receipt for a, credit, uh, for a transaction if I need to. You know, going back to that coffee shop example, if I need to apply a tip to a transaction, I can do that. Um, partially return transactions and void transactions, these are a little bit more uh, involved and again, a security issue. But if I void a transaction, it makes it like, you know, it never happened, okay? Outside of that reporting element that happens at the end of the day. So I cannot void a transaction more than once, okay? And the partial return is smart enough to where if I, for example, um, you know, if I, for example, 
sold a case of wine, 12 let's say, and added a partial return where I returned one bottle. The system knows that there are only 11 that remain to be returned and I cannot return more than that. So the partial return, partially returned transaction is smart. Um, there is another way to do a return, actually two more. One is just by virtue of scanning a past receipt. Now again, I'm not going to some function where I'm telling it I'm going to scan a barcode. I'm just scanning. Okay. And the system is, is recalling it. Now, actually, this transaction occurred at a different store, not the Minneapolis location like I'm about to sell out of. So, um, you know, I can just scan that barcode and the system's smart enough to know that that's what I'm trying to do and I can void it or return it from here. The last way that I can do a return is through something called return mode. Okay, when I click it, little red ring shows up around the grid and it says return mode and now anything that I scan is going to show up with a negative quantity. Okay. Um, and I mean if you don't have a receipt or you know you can't find it or whatever you just need to do a return this is a very simple way to do that. Notice discounts are going to be applied in reverse um, and a return, as far as car retailer is concerned, is really just the same as selling a negative quantity. Now, return mode is going to stay on until you either finish a sale or until you turn it off. Okay, so I'm out of return mode now, and now anything that I sell is going to um, is going to show up as a positive quantity. So I hypothetically could do a, 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 an exchange. I could return two things and sell two more things. And the difference is 1854. All right, so we're going to move on to some of the more, a few kind of semi-advanced functions of the POS. Um, first one we're going to talk about is orders. So I'm going to scan an item here, and I've got these buttons down here that say hold and recall hold. Now, the topic of orders and how they're configured and work is a subject of, uh, you know, a deeper dive training. But you can configure as many different types of orders as you want. Out of the box, we give you something we call a hold, which is a really simple order. A lot of customers that do e-commerce orders have any an order type you know basically order buckets for uh, uh, e-commerce some have some that are called work orders and you can define the behavior around these order types like do they require a customer do they require a deposit etc a hold is just really simple so I've got a customer I've rang up all their stuff and they're feeling around in their pockets looking for their credit card and they realize it's out in the car but you've got a line of customers, right? You don't want to redo this transaction, so you put it on hold. So I put it on hold. I can help the next customer, and when they come back, I can say recall hold. And here's the transaction that I just put on hold. Um, and, and away I go. I can finish this transaction. Now what's neat about a hold is that there's a, feed, there's a setting on it called scope. And the scope of hold is uh, all stores. So I mentioned it earlier, and this kind of gives you a little bit more insight into how it can work, but if I create a hold, I can pick up the hold order at another location or another register. Um, so pretty, pretty handy. Uh, so let's tender this out. Okay, and uh, um, another, another example of kind of an advanced workflow is the ability to define quantities in a, just a fewer keystrokes. So I'll do it the long way first by scanning an item and now I'll click on quantity. Notice there's a void line button right here, very, you know, try to make it convenient. I'm going to say 12 and I'm going to set quantity. Actually, I'm going to do I'm going to do that again. I'm going to ring up a bottle of Behringer. Let's say 2. Okay, you can see there's no discount. I'm going to say 12. 
Now notice, here again is an example, mix and match discounting. Buy any 12 bottles of wine, mix and match, get 10% off. But, you know, click on quantity, change the quantity. In, in a day and age of, of, you know, when there's so much turnover, it's got to be, it's got to be that simple. On the other hand, if you have an advanced cashier who wants to know how to speed things up, I can type in 10 star and then scan or hit this button and it automatically rings it up uh, with a quantity of 10. Um, uh, there's a few other kind of quick keys just like that but the quantity star is an example of one that people use quite a bit. Um, a t another topic I'm just going to touch on is rentals. So Cloud Retailer has the ability to do some light rental functionality. And it seems like, you know, a, a lot of retailers you really do a little bit of rental, even though they might not think it's rental. So we're in a beer, wine, liquor database. I'm going to use the example of keg. So I'm going to ring up a keg. Now, right out of the gate, one interesting thing you'll notice is that I rang up a keg, but it also rang up a keg deposit, which is indented. This is a tag along item. Okay, so when I ring this one item up, it rings up another. Very easy to set that up. Uh, with the coffee shop that I mentioned earlier, they may set up ingredients. So I could have a coffee with a flavor shot in it or a bagel with cheese and no mayonnaise. Um, so uses a similar concept to get that done. Um, notice that this keg deposit has a serial number. And this is automatically generated by the system. But this keg deposit has been identified as a rental item. So when you sell a keg, there's this aluminum shell that's worth money, quite a bit of money. In this case, $35. And the customer has to bring that back if they want to get it back. You don't think of it as rental, but that is rental. Um, you might also rent taps or tubs or what have you. Um, where somebody pays you for a rental fee, they give you a deposit, and then you give them money back when they bring it back. Now, when I go to tender this transaction, of quite a few things are different. Um, so it's telling me that there are some products that require a customer to be set. Okay, so I can search now. And notice it also said you could scan a driver's license now. We're going to come back to that. So I'm going to type in Rick F. The customer search is intelligent like the product search is. I don't have to know everything to give a good search to, you know, find the customer that I'm looking for, even if I have a large data set of customers. So I'll select this person. And now and only now can I finish a transaction. Um, when I... I can require certain fields to be populated on that customer record, and if they weren't, it would have given me a warning. So maybe I require address, maybe I require email address. You can determine what is required on a customer record. Um, it can be configured that way, at least. Now, when I tender this transaction, a few things happen a little bit differently. We'll see it when I finish this out. Um, in, in this case, we actually have the system configured to print two receipts instead of one. And it also has a bunch of legalese at the bottom about not giving minors any beer. Uh, and in a lot of states, that's required. And so the customer gets a copy, you keep a copy, and then this PDF is printing. Really, this is a tag uh, that goes to a tag printer. It's really just another receipt that's printing out. But this tag is a sticker that gets affixed to the keg, and it has that serial number that we looked at earlier on it. And you can scan that serial number in order to find and return that keg and give the customer back their money. Uh, so pretty, pretty interesting, very handy. Um, I mentioned driver's license scanning. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm going to scan a Minnesota ID Okay, so um, in the state of Minnesota, it captures a lot of data. And actually, I ran this through a magnetic stripe reader. 
uh, because on a Minnesota ID, that's where a lot of the information is. But it populated basically everything. On the training video, it's going to be all fogged out, so nobody has my personal info. But, uh, um, uh, you know, at this point, this would also work with a 2D barcode scanner. So that's not going to be your standard barcode scanner. You have to have one that's a step up. Um, but it works with, you know, basically all states. Um, and, uh, you know, you can use it for the sake of age verification. Or you can also use it to collect customer information. Now, if you're going to do that, you need to have a privacy policy posted. But notice that it says create customer. That's grayed out because the system already knows me. So by swiping my ID, the customer that I had set up in the system is being attached to this transaction and it can track my purchase history, etc. cetera. Um, we could view the details there, but if I was a new customer, this create customer button would be enabled. And I, if I click on it, it would pre-populate a new customer record with all of these details so that I'd have very little to fill out. Um, now, this driver's license scanning technology is used by more retailers than you think. For one, it makes setting people up with, in a customer loyalty program way faster for the customer. So customers like it. Um, um, or two, it can be an age verification tool. Um, we can set up the system to require age verification to occur before a transaction is completed. Um, and so, uh, you know, and, and by the way, if you don't create a customer and that can be disabled, the only thing that this does is just basically work as age verification. This information still is displayed to the cashier for the sake of making sure that the, that the it's a legitimate ID. I can compare that to what's printed on the ID. And the application is even smart enough to identify some fake IDs. Um, not all, though. I mean, they make fake IDs that can get you through the airport. So if it can get you through the airport, probably will uh, work on the point of sale as well. Um, so it can be purely an age verification tool. And the only thing it would collect at that point is the date of birth. And it would print that on the receipt. And the receipt stored in the system so that if uh, you know the police came in and said, hey, I found some kids with a pint next to the store, or had your price sticker on it, you know, you potentially could reprint that receipt and say, hey, remember the guy I sold it to, you know, go talk to Rick. Because I checked the ID. It says right here, date of birth, 1882. Um, so from here, we can close uh, this form and go back to the transaction, or the other option was close and tender. You know, most of the time, the ID verification is happening at the end of the sale, so close and tender can be a good deal. We have this fake item, age verification item being sold. This is just to keep that track record of the fact that we verified an age um, and it's, it's used for reporting. Okay, so there's just a couple more kind of advanced topics here that I want to discuss. Um, uh, one of them is repeating barcodes. So uh, in a lot, with a lot of our clients in different industries, you get vendors that sell you different products, but they use the same barcode. They're really not supposed to do that. I'm not sure why they do. You know, having owning a UPC code costs some money, so maybe that's the issue. But you'll you'll get those pain in the neck um, manufacturers that'll do that to you. Um, so how do you manage that? So I've got an example set up. In our system, it's called a repeating barcode. And this is a, a real life example. Alaskan seasonal beer it comes in a winter and it comes in a summer. They have the same barcode. The manufacturer just calls them seasonal. And maybe that works okay for them, but it's really hard on the retailers who sell this product because in the fall, they may have some summer ale left over and they're clearancing it out, you know, for five bucks a six pack. And the winter ale just came in hot off the truck. They don't want to discount that. And they need to keep inventory of these things separately. So in the back office, you can set up something called a repeating barcode attached to both of these. And when you scan it, it gives you a prompt. You need to select one. This way, you can have a different price. And you can keep inventory of these products separately. 
Now I've over and over again talked about cashiers not paying attention to the screen and now we've got one of these prompts and you heard that angry noise trying to get the cashier's attention but what happens if they're not paying attention? I'm going to scan a product. Okay. Notice you saw it in the background. My product count went from one to two. Okay. I can hypothetically keep ringing this transaction up and this prompt is still here so that when I do look down and see this, I need to deal with it. But all the stuff I did in between here and there, the POS system still kept on working. Um, so I'll select one. I'll select that summer ale. You can see it's on sale. Oh, it's not on sale. I'm sorry. Um, and, and, and away I go. Um, the the last uh, advanced topic I want to discuss is our products that aren't in the system or manufacturer changed product packaging or a new flavor came out or something to that effect um, if I scan one of those items there again I get that angry noise and I get a prompt saying hey I don't know what this is how do you want to proceed okay now um, I could, if the product does exist in the system, it's just the barcode's wrong, that the product packaging issue where the supplier just changed the product packaging, you know, I could look up and find it. Or I can sell a miscellaneous item. Now, this is a task pad just like any other. I can apply permissions to what you can and can't do. I can give and take away what these buttons are. Obviously, miscellaneous liquor is not going to, going to apply to a lot of our customers. And as a matter of fact, this idea of selling a miscellaneous item is not something a lot of our customers want to allow their cashiers to do. It's a little bit dangerous. Um, it'll screw up the inventory of the item that they are selling, etc. So it's at your discretion. Um, so let's say, um, you know, this is a new flavor of Jack Daniels. It's not in the system yet. So I'm going to say Jack Dan tea flavor. Okay. And then I'm going to say miscellaneous liquor. And I'm going to say $14.99. All right. So you can see it's selling miscellaneous liquor, wine, beer, $14.99. But notice this little comment below that. It says PNF. PNF stands for product not found. Here's the barcode of the product that's sold. And here's the description I entered, Jack Dan T. Notice on this Alaskan Summer Ale, it says NS. That stands for the fact that this item was added to the transaction through some type of search or some type of prompt. And that stands for not scanned. That can be interesting too. People like to be able to report on that to, you know, figure out if cashiers are looking things up when they should be scanning or vice versa. Um, now, you probably could have guessed that this information about PNF is tracked by the system, and it is. It shows up in a report. And I think that's pretty cool. I don't know very many systems that make it that easy to capture the UPC on the product and gather information about it. But, that's, but, but really the power of the system is that any report that you can create in the back office can also be set up as an email alert. Okay, that means you can get reports once a day, once a week, once a month. You know, we have a customer that their accounting staff used to spend the first three hours every Monday fetching reports. Well, we can automate that. But what's really cool about this example is that the alerts could fire off once every two minutes. Okay, so if it was a report that you ran once a day, you would see it tomorrow morning and then you would try to figure out what the heck is Jack Daniels tea there is no such thing and then you you could see on the report who did it and when they did it which till they did it at etc and you would try to go find the cashier who had done this and realize that they're not working today they're gonna come in three days ago three days from now on Friday um, well when you see them next guess what they're not gonna remember I mean um, however if you set this up as an alert and that alert goes into your email that's on your phone and you get a little ding and you look, I guarantee you if you go talk to them 10 minutes after this happened, you'll know what they were talking about. And maybe they realize it wasn't Jack Daniels, it was Evan Williams, you know, a different whiskey that looks the same or whatever. Um, the power of that instant feedback 
uh, is is really cool. You you will get your UPC issues corrected in a timely manner using something like this. Okay, so there's definitely more to learn and talk about as it relates to the cloud retailer point of sale, but this video should have given you a pretty solid base understanding of how the system works. I hope it was helpful.